Alhamdulillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah 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 ar-Rahim
And I was writing down everything. I'm thinking, wait, am I defining myself? Is this me right now? And I became to understand and recognize that maybe I was going through burnout. There was too much on my plate and it was just murking everything. And I was reflecting and I was trying to find out what to do. I, I opened um, um, a Sira book and I arrived at Hadith Jibreel. And I, everyone is probably aware of Hadith Jibreel with Iman, Islam, Ihsan, and how Angel Jibreel arrives and he sits. But I paid attention to the first part of the Hadith where this man in white, as, as Umar bin Khattab anhu says, this man in white, his clothes are non-wrinkled, non-dusty, and he arrives and he comes and sits to the front and he faces the prophet and he's sitting um, knee to knee with him with full attention. And he is basically giving us a master class on how to focus, how to maintain a boundary and how to get the maximum out of the time that you have with your scholar, with what you are intending to do, because he is completely face to face in front of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as he's asking and answering questions. And, he's, and they are giving us a masterclass on what integrity looks like. And in that moment, I realized I could only do one of the two. I could either work or I could continue my MDiv so that I could excel and get the complete integrity out of it. And it was the next week that I had to go into work and I had to ask my, my, my boss, who is my, one of my closest friends, that I am unable to do this because this is... This is um, this is crossing the line of there's an amana that your work imposes on you, right? I could easily say I'm working from home and then be doing my assignments on the side and that. It's a very simple story, but it just makes you think what boundaries look like. And as much as we want someone to impose them on us, we have to hold ourselves accountable and hold them for ourselves as well, especially as adults. Now for children, of course, parents will have to do it for them. Parents will have to see when the child needs a nap, they need to wake up because they are um, they are in charge and they are, they, are, they are taking care of them and they're caretakers for them. However, when we think about each other, uh, what does what does boundaries look like in the Quran for all of us? We can all remember a time when someone probably came to us and talked to us about another person. Is was that a crossing of a boundary? What even though we may think, oh, it was so much fun, I was able to catch up with this person, and we get started talking about someone else. And as the Quran tells us in Surah Hujarat, it says, "O believers, avoid many suspicions." For indeed, some suspicions are sinful. Do not spy nor backbite one another. Would any of you like to eat the flesh of their dead brother? You would despise that. Fear Allah. Surely Allah is the acceptor of repentance, most merciful. So the Quran sets a boundary on respecting each other's privacy. Another boundary that the Quran sets is self-respect and agency. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Baqarah says, spend in the cause of Allah and do not let your own hands throw you into destruction by withholding and do good for Allah certainly loves the do-gooders. So you have money, you're going to spend in the cause of Allah and you're going to avoid yourselves. This is my own agency. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me self-agency in how I'm going to spend. You may choose to spend today and give generously to Ehsan because of the wonderful work it does. But this is your agency that you're using to do good for certainly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the do-gooders. How do you balance each other's rights? Again, the Quran goes back in Surah Qasas. Rather seek the reward of the hereafter by means of what Allah has granted you without forgetting your share of this world and be good to others as Allah has been good to you. Do not seek to spread corruption in the land for Allah certainly does not like the corruptors. So if you even reflect on these ayahs, you may think these are all personal boundaries. How does that affect the community? 
But as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also showing us here is when we avoid suspicion, we are not hurting the community around each other, but we are also holding each other accountable. That doesn't mean you are not holding each other accountable and you're not self-regulating. Even in the seerah, the Prophet ﷺ, the seerah is, oh my God, it is so beautiful. It is a love story by the Sahaba of how the Prophet ﷺ led his life. If we look at, so a few examples from the seerah. Um, the Prophet ﷺ, when um, Hazrat Fatima's hands are calloused, because she has been working so hard on the mill where she would have to grind the stone and grind the wheat, um, wheat the grain to make the flour. And that's what they would sell or use in the house for their livelihood. Um, um, Hazrat Ali uh, would be, would, to, would carry water on his back as his profession to get some livelihood. They, they were very, very simple people. But if you look in today's times, you'll probably think of Hazrat Fatima as a princess, but that's not the life she's living, right? Because her, her father in his guidance and his wisdom was setting realistic expectations for her. Even when she comes to him with complete shyness upon uh, her husband, um, sort of nudging her to go and ask her father for maybe a person to help in the house. And she comes with complete shyness. She almost cannot say it and she returns back. It's so beautiful, that story between a father and um, a daughter. But uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam realizes what she came to him for. And she, he comes back to them in the evening and he says, uh, I know you were probably looking for this. But let me give you something better. Subhanallah. The, I mean, subhanallah. What, what a beautiful parenting moment, a guiding moment, a reality setting moment where he shows her something better and he gives her the tasbih of Fatima, which we all recite after just about every prayer and anytime we want to. It's the 33 of subhanallah, 33 of alhamdulillah, and 33 of Allah Akbar. And he says, let me give you something better. What is time and energy management? How Prophet Muhammad balances between tasks and personal time. He balances, he, if he needs to pray. I still remember going to Pakistan and visiting my mother and any time we're about to sit for a meal, my mother will get up and say, I need to pray. And I always say, you don't eat with us. Why don't you eat with us? These are simple boundaries. These are not, these are simple conversations. But if you pay attention to them, where is the health of the family going? What is happening with these things? And Prophet Muhammad all his, um, his meals are with people. He's never eating by himself. He doesn't get up and go to pray. In fact, he even says, delay prayer till the meal is done. Or he says, let's pray before we start eating. Or he gets up in the middle of the night and he does his tahajjud where he doesn't disturb anyone. So his maximum responsibility, energy, love, submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. He shows us how to do it perfectly, beautifully, but he doesn't take away from the rights of his family on him the rights of the Sahaba on him, the rights of the community on him. The, look, look at the example of his solitude to the cave of Hera for reflection. It's a boundary setting. He sets a boundary to reflect, to go away. He's not understanding what's happening in the society. He's thinking, these things don't look right. I don't know what's happening. Think of where we are today in this world. We look at things on social media and the news, horrible things are happening across the world and in our backyard. What do we do? The Prophet Muhammad showed us how to set this boundary for reflection. He would just quietly leave the space, find a reflection point, and that's where he would go. So he could meditate, look back, look inward, pray, 
and ask Allah subhanahu wa for guidance. Um, and if you look at it, this is also not happening like right when he got married to Hazrat Khatija. So if, if someone is like getting married tomorrow, I don't want you to get up in the middle of the night and go to the cave of Hera. You need to give time to your wife. You need to build your house, build your family. Then let your wife know that you're going to the cave because you need to reflect. You cannot just vanish from your responsibilities, your boundaries, work that you need to do. And Bibi Khatija is the one that brings him food and nourishment while he is there. This, I mean, the, our examples are so beautiful. They're so simple and beautiful. I feel like in today's world, we somehow magnify them or we place them at such a high pedestal that we feel like, oh, we can't do this. This is impossible. But what does it look like in your day-to-day? -day? What does your personal worship time look like? What does your cave of Hera look like? What does your Tasbih, Fatima, and Akhira classes look like? What does your routine for reaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what you need? What does your zikr and Quran recitation routine look like? Is it taking over the boundaries, the needs, the roles, the responsibilities. These are almost interchangeable word, words when they're applied correctly, accurately. Is it bleeding into or taking away from someone else's boundary? Think of yourself as a, as a vector diagram. You know, the circles we learn in school, we have in math, we have the subsets. So if you, if Allah SWT is right in the middle, when the Venn diagram matches, what are the parts that overlap and what are the parts that have to be kept separate and have to be paid attention to? What does it look like for you? I would ask you to adopt them, any one of these that you want, that you are pulled to, whether it's a work and family balance boundary, whether it's a worship, meditation, uh, dhikr, Quran, what does your personal time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look like? Honestly, for me, it's sometimes just driving in the car. That's my time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because no one can reach me. <laughs> no one can ask me for if my, my kids are not in the car. But it's my time with him. I can talk to him. I can, you know, I can think of what I need to think of and I can get that done. Maybe when you're walking outside in the evening, but set a time to just talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will prioritize self-care and family connection because when you return back to your family, you are recharged and you can take care of them. I would just like to say that boundaries embody self-respect and alignment, but you do it with divine guidance. Look to the seerah, look to the Quran before we implement them. There are so many gurus out there, mindfulness techniques, all of these, they all start from your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Ground yourself in your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as our perfect example with everyday examples for us. Use that and then reflect, identify your areas and then take them on. Wa akhiru darabana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Inshallah. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of nourishment contained in your thoughts and reflections. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of benefit, a lot of real life practical benefit. I like the metaphor of, you know, what is your own personal cave of hira? What works for you in your situation Based on reality, no one is saying to act as if whatever your situation is, is not your situation, but to see, okay, what is a realistic figurative cave of Hira for me? It could be driving in your car for mm. those 20 minutes from whatever, <laughs> whatever works in someone's day and someone's week that uh, that's realistic and, and practical for them. And uh, it's, it's not a, reflection self-reflection mindfulness they they directly connect with boundaries 
They do. They do. It requires energy to establish boundaries and to reinforce them. And that energy is directly tied with um, recharging, right? So that all of these things are connected. Um, if if someone, let's say someone, they're going through burnout. Let's say they're stuck in whatever situation where maybe they don't have a choice between you know, work, school, family, kids, parents, whatever it may be. Where would you recommend for this person to start? If they're just, they're busy, they're all over the place. They wish they didn't have so many responsibilities, but maybe they do. Where can they start? What's like a, a practical, maybe one minute, two minute process or mm -hmm. activity or they start <laughs> Actually, excellent question, uh, Brother Bilal, because I had the privilege to recognize and be able to leave one thing to pursue the other, right? But mm -hmm. others, someone else may be saying, oh my God, that's a choice I don't have. That's a privilege you are announcing, but I don't have that. I have to take care of uh, my family. I have to provide and I have to study because then that leads me to my next better job out there. But mm -hmm. even while you're doing any of these, I, I think back to, um, it was Omar Farooq where he was traveling and he uh, stepped into, he had arrived earlier and the mosque was not open yet. So he was trying to go into the mosque. I believe it's Omar Farooq, but I may be incorrect, but he's trying to go in and the mosque is not open yet for Fajr. He's arrived earlier. So before mm -hmm. that, the bread maker arrives and oh, sees- Imam, Imam Ahmed. You know, Imam Ahmed, sorry. Yeah. See, so I knew that. Great, another great figure. Yeah. See, so, so this, this is this is mindfulness in action. Mm -hmm. uh, the the baker sees Imam Ahmed in the middle of the night. He doesn't know it's Imam Ahmed, and mm -hmm. he says, "What are you doing on the street?" He says, "I'm waiting for the mosque to open for Fajr." He says, "Come in and sit here, and you know, we will just, you know, we you can go once it's uh, the mosque is open." He follows the baker, and he just is quietly just observing the baker with what the the baker is doing his work he's literally up at the hajjud time now he has no time for the hajjud because that's his peak business time he has to prepare the bread so it's risen and it's ready but the entire time he's reciting astaghfar mm -hmm. the entire time he's working he yeah. is working, he's working hard, he left his family, he's probably sleepy, he's groggy, he's tired, his arms are hurting, his body is hurting, but he's just reciting astaghfar. And mm -hmm. Imam Ahmed says, what does this astaghfar do for you? Look at the wisdom of Imam Ahmed. He does not say, brilliant job, you're so amazing, you've been reading astaghfar. He comes from this curiosity of, I know nothing, tell me what you know. And he says, what is this istighfar? He said, it gives me everything I've ever asked for. So in that time of, of, of finding his own hira, he literally found it in the middle of his busiest time of day. Mm -hmm. That man was quite amazing. I don't know how I could do that, but he did it. And, mm -hmm. and, and he says, the only thing left is I asked, I've asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I could meet Imam Ahmed, but I haven't been able to do that yet. And Imam mm -hmm. Ahmed says, oh, because Imam Ahmed was thrown out of the mosque because he goes in before it's open and they pull him out. They drag him out and they put him on the street that it's not open yet. So Imam Ahmed said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dragged me out of the mosque so I could be on the street, so I could be brought to you. This is how effective your istighfar was. So my recommendation would be look at where you are, find mm -hmm. your grounding, find your time. Um, it can, um, for me, what has worked is walking around with some prayer beads because mm. I have, if I have them in my hand, yeah. I know to move them. And if I move them, I'm going to say something. <laughs> so it, 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 it helps. Yeah. And what's interesting is there, there, uh, different people have different preferences, right? Mm -hmm. So some people, I mean, this is classic education theory. You have the more visual learners, the more auditory learners, then you have the kinesthetic learners where they really, really benefit from having something tangible they can touch and feel. Yes. Right? For, for someone, they may benefit a lot more than perhaps someone else from having an actual physical test beat, something mm -hmm. physical 
in their hand and that can help their you know mind to hand connection of yes. doing the dhikr doing the tasbih that can tie in with tasbih fatima yes right what you mentioned just a few moments ago and how uh there can be practical ways what what you just mentioned is actually may Allah bless you that's actually a very good example if someone looks at their life and they feel overwhelmed they have work here they have school there they have this and that responsibility how in the world am i supposed to simply isolate in this cave of Hira? well mm -hmm. what did the baker do he made the most of his situation even though he couldn't go to his figurative Hira, he brought it to him in a sense mm -hmm. Exactly. He brought the hira. He said, come to work. Let's go together and we'll just do this. So he made his bakery into his hira, right? So someone maybe gave the example of driving. And that can be a time of reflection, a time to talk mm -hmm. to Allah. Maybe someone is going to be driving those 10, 15 minutes anyways. Yes. I can make istighfar one day. Maybe another day is something heavy is on my heart. I just need to talk to Allah. Mm-hmm. People think of du'a only as asking Allah. Asking Allah is part of du'a. But when you look at different instances in the Qur'an, it's not always only asking Allah. You also have instances of like Prophet Ayyub mm -hmm. Yes. If you look at what he says, both in Surah Anbiya and in Surah Sad. In Surah Anbiya, أَنِّي مَسَنِيَ الدُّرْ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّحِيمِ Yes. I've been afflicted with some hardship and you're the most merciful of those capable of showing mercy. And Allah responds saying, and we responded to him yes. and we gave him more than what he had before. So that process of just talking to Allah may be what a person needs most. Allah knows that, Allah sees that, and that may be what facilitates Allah sending some ease, sending some aid, uh, sooner or later, the, the, the situation will, inshallah, improve. Maybe to one day have that luxury of maybe physically going to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, their, their own uh, cave of Hira. But in the meantime, the baker made istighfar where he, he has to bake the bread anyways. He has to do it. Yes. So let me make istighfar. It's, it's a repetitive task. Right. I tell you, I heard this. Um, I heard this sheikh in the Yaqeen thirty for thirty, where mm -hmm. he is talking about um, his baby daughter just crying as a baby, and he's trying to put her to sleep. So he said, mm -hmm. "I'm trying to put her to sleep, and I'm she is not going to sleep." I think ninety percent of us who. Well, 100% who've had babies or 90% who've seen people with babies know this movement of just shaking a baby and just trying to get them to sleep. And he said, as I was doing that, I was realizing I am getting, you know, anxious and I'm getting tensed up. He said, then I started reciting, subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah lazim. And as I'm doing that, I started doing that. And then for a good 20 minutes, I'm reciting, I'm doing my tasbih. And she has gone to sleep. I have calmed down. There's a self-regulation that has happened. And she has gone to sleep. And he said, and then I thought, with every subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah lazim, as promised by, or as informed by Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam during Mi'raj, is that a tree is planted in uh, Jannah for you. He said that I am looking forward to seeing those trees and walking them with my daughter and showing her this is what happened when you were not going to sleep and we were able to build a garden together. So oh. it, it was so beautiful the way he said it. I was like, oh man, I wish I knew this when my babies were crying. <laughs> just... yeah. yeah, the baby is crying anyways. Anyway, anyway, you're it's awake. happening. Yeah, yeah, you're awake anyways. So mm -hmm. how... And there be really dhikr is so powerful and so beautiful in so many ways it's so mm -hmm. simple but it's also uh so impactful uh so soothing right um and uh, it also automatically draws that boundary around you because mm -hmm. if you are grounding yourself in dhikr a lot of things are simultaneously happening, right? We just recognize so many. 
Imam Hamil is being dragged to your door. Your baby is going to sleep and then this green lush forest is being planted for you in, in heaven. You are, um, you are doing the task that may be the most mundane, but now you are connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's so much baraka in it. And baraka, I feel, is one of those words that almost does not have a translation in English. Because how can you explain it? Because it's so many things that are happening at the same time. Time is expanding, what you're getting out of it is expanding. But at the same time, if I am driving and um, something is not going the way it needs to go, but I'm constantly reciting some dhikr or I'm having a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while I'm driving, I'm also setting this boundary. So boundaries are not just for keeping things out. They're also for keeping things in. So it's for keeping my faith and my connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in. And at the same time, it is protecting me while that action is happening around me that I, on the outside, look like I have no control over. I'm stuck on, let's say, the Bay Bridge, right? I'm stuck on a Bay Bridge for 20 minutes and I'm just stuck there. But if I am constantly reciting my afkar, I'm also being actively protected at that time, I am actively connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm also not thinking of other people, of gossiping, of things that went wrong, thinking bad about my boss, thinking weirdly about my teachers, thinking about something. Because so I have set, I have locked in my, my own self in something that's beautiful. And I've also been encapsulated and protected mm -hmm. from other things that could be harming me. Mm -hmm. So there is this double uh, support that comes from setting a boundary. So mm -hmm. if I have a boundary of, I don't go out after 7 p.m. because that is my time that I can give. So two things are gonna happen, right? One, you're going to identify a boundary today. You're going to identify what is my boundary. Is my boundary that I'm going to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when something really out of control is happening? Or the most mundane thing that happens in my day, I'm going to use that to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you are plugging in to charge yourself while um, something is happening. Or two, you are also thinking, what am I going to do if now somebody invites me after seven Am I able to hold this boundary? Because it, it doesn't happen by just setting the boundary. You also have to hold the boundary. And that's probably the harder part because mm. it's very easy to say, fine, from today, I'm just going to be doing this. But then something will happen that will yeah. come to your boundary. So a mm. healthy boundary is something that even if it gets, uh, it, it has a little bit of flexibility in it. So even if today I was not able to pray, maybe tomorrow I can wake up 10 minutes before Fajr and, and, and confirm that boundary to myself. I have to hold myself accountable to the boundary that I set. Did I set a boundary of not scrolling Instagram after 10 p.m.? Because that was the time that I could be praying. But I was so busy scrolling for another 40 minutes and now I'm gone from there. So again, I, the boundary is mine, the responsibility is mine, the accountability is mine. And I think when we as a community start setting those healthy boundaries, mm -hmm. then the community starts self-regulating. You know, think of a house where all the lights have gone out and one person in the corner just lights a candle, the smallest candle there is. But once it was dark and a candle has come in, and Satamara says it beautifully, she says, if a room is pitch dark and you open the door and the, even a sliver of light comes in, the room is not pitch dark anymore. Nobody can call it dark anymore because light has started to come in. So if the light has started to come in, then another person will do that. Another, but pretty soon the whole house is going to be lit up and it's going to self-regulate and it's going to work on that. I hope that makes sense, but I'm a visual person. So I so visual learning, right? Completely. <laughs> I'm imagining a candle 
And that's actually a very uh, powerful metaphor because if one person has a candle, let's say you have several people and everyone has a candle, the first person lights theirs. If they share their light with someone else, it's a, it's a beautiful metaphor for knowledge. Yes. They share their light, their flame with someone else. They lose nothing and the other person gains light and heat. And then if they share it with someone else, the first person definitely d still doesn't lose anything. And then the second person sharing it with the third. So you have the, the Senate here of the chain. <laughs> it is the Senate. We are, we are a community, a faith, a beautiful tradition of Sanad. And for us, that's why I, I go back to the Sira. Any question I have in life, mm -hmm. I have to go back to my Sira book. Mm -hmm. And I will have to look at that because if you, my, my favorite activity is picking up a hadith that's very popular mm -hmm. and then going to the expanded version of it, of what was happening. Mm -hmm. And just the, you know, the behind the scenes of the, like, like I did with Hadith Jibril right now, right? That was the yeah. behind the scenes of just, I'm not even paying attention to Iman, Islam and Ihsan. I'm mm -hmm. looking at just how he came in and he sat down. The mm -hmm. fact that... Right? Emphasizing, right? Jibreel was fully present with the Prophet. Yes. And the Prophet was fully present with him. And yeah. it was just so, if you pick any hadith, um, so I will give you homework. Pick up any hadith you like, whichever yeah. one you like, and try to go to the macro of it and just look at what was happening when this hadith was said and who are the players of that hadith. Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely mind-blowing because you see how the community was working together mm -hmm. it's not just a one-liner where mm -hmm. I, I has it Aisha says who do I feed first do I feed my Jewish neighbor or do I feed my neighbor on this side and Prophet Muhammad says feed your Jewish neighbor because he's close to you but if you go to the macro of it it's so beautiful where she says, I woke up, I made the bread. I wanted to make the bread for him because I know when he comes back from Taj and from Isha, he likes to eat something. But when he came back, he didn't eat. And then we went to sleep and then the goat came in and then the goat started to touch. the. It's so cute. It's like this one family scene that you're watching from the back. And I'm thinking I can relate to all of these as a wife, as a mom, as someone who wants to have things prepared. But when my husband comes home and then he doesn't have the bread that I prepared for him, in the end, I say, fine, I'll just give it to the neighbor. Which one should I give it to? It's mm -hmm. just, it suddenly becomes doable. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it, it, it's, it, these were real people, right? With yeah. real scenarios. Very, that's very relatable. <laughs> yeah. I... <laughs> yeah. The tension was made and okay, so... How can I, how can I pivot? How do I make the most of this? Well, look, look at look at proximity. Which one is closer than mm -hmm. that neighbor? Uh, start start there. You mentioned earlier uh, Surah Hujurat, which yes. that Surah is it ties in with like the entire Surah it ties in yes. with this whole discussion really well. That Surah is known as the Surah of Adam. Yes. That Surah gets its name, Fajurat, the apartments, it has to do with boundaries mm -hmm. and respecting the boundaries of the prophet and his family. Yes. He show up, whether it was in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day at the time of taking a nap. It was at a time when people had their family time, people had their alone time, people, it was time to take a nap or go to sleep or that was the norm in mm -hmm. that society. And then these people show up and they, so wrong, wrong time. They go to the prophets outside of his home yeah. at the wrong time. Uh -huh. And the way they address him is in the wrong way. They call him by his first name. That's a no-no. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Muhammad. Oh, Muhammad, come out to us. Hold come on. Come out to us. Yeah. <laughs> the time is wrong. The way you're addressing him is wrong by name. And then what your the the demands you're placing on him based on what's convenient for you without thinking about him and his situation, there's so many things that are uh that are wrong in this scenario, but it's very interesting the way that Allah corrects them because these were brand new converts, 
Yes. They, they hadn't gone through the sira refinement process yet. Yes. Raw material. So the way that Allah corrects them, when you look at it closely, Allah says he's forgiving and merciful. Like, don't do this. Allah is forgiving and merciful. Yes. Because of where they are, it's the very beginning of their journey. They're still very rough around the edges. So you find there it, it's wrong. Allah corrects them. But there's a, l a little bit of grace in, in how Allah corrects them. In SubhanAllah, Allah is setting this boundary for the Prophet, like on the Prophet's behalf, alayhi mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you find also in the surah when there, there was this, uh, you know, friendly argument, you could say, between Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar. They're much, much, much further along in their journey. So Allah corrects them. But the way that Allah corrects them is with a little bit more firmness. Mm -hmm. A lot more firmness. Well, because of who they are. Because of who they are. SubhanAllah. So all of this, is, the whole surah is about boundaries, though. It is. It is. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm so happy you, you know, reminded me of Surah Hujarat because it is the boundary setting surah. <laughs> Yeah. If you want to look at what boundaries look like and how they are, they are also differentiated for who is being addressed. If it's a new um, newcomer who does not know the rules, they are being dealt with different uh, a different set of mercy and rahma and openness. So it doesn't scare them away. And whereas the seasoned Sahabas are dealt with differently so that they can be corrected. And if you even think of it like as a, what you said, right, the Sira correction, the, the if you look at the school of Sira, you cannot, mm -hmm. you know, reprimand the preschoolers the way you would high schoolers, right? So you do differentiation. And mm -hmm. we somehow know how to apply these things very correctly when i use the word boundary someone will think of a city outer limits okay where does the city end and the city begin what happens here what happens there think of an airport mm -hmm. nobody crosses a boundary at an airport mm -hmm. ever mm -hmm. we we even see the sign that says this alarm will sign we walk away from it because we're like i'm not going there because they're just gonna just pull me away i'm never gonna get my flight i'm never gonna get where i want to go I always use the airport as the mental example for me to recognize boundaries. Mm -hmm. You are not, even though TSA pre-check is taking so long, you're still going to do it because it's a boundary that's been set. Mm -hmm. If you are now going to stand in line, if they say they need to see your suitcase, you're going to open your suitcase. Even though you were randomly selected, you're still going to stand there. You're not going to say, why was I randomly selected? Because it's not the time or place to uh, challenge the boundary because you recognize that it's a boundary. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you are going to go from, go to the gate early, arrive to the airport late, those are your flexible boundaries. So also recognize who you are in that boundary setting. And, and the boundary is there to bridge what your action is, what your intention is, and to do it with integrity. It's like that that beautiful bridge that happens for you to be able to get from here to there with integrity. Yeah, for that, that visual. <laughs> Always. <a> learner. So, <laughs> so I, I appreciate um, all, all different avenues of learning, whether visual or, or listening. So auditory, kinesthetic, um, but that, that mind map, that visual mm -hmm. of, okay, you know, when when it when it comes to certain uh, boundaries, setting expectations, I wanna I wanna ask you something that's arguably at the core of this whole discussion. Mm -hmm. No, when it comes to say someone volunteering, they want to serve their community and they have really good intentions. Yes, and we see very quickly that oh, there's a need for like a hundred different things that need to be done. It, let's say they start with helping out with one, two, three, four, five things. And and then it, other people start to notice that, oh, this person seems to be reliable. And you also take care of six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
11, 12, 13. Eventually, it becomes too much. And eventually, yes. burnout happens. So just to make up, you know, arbitrary numbers, one year of over-dedication may burn a person out, say, for 10 years. True. Because there was... So th there, there's a need, both internally within the person to to have the ability to say no i can do one two three four five i don't have the capacity for six and to say no that's okay now this, this becomes very difficult for some people because you have a lot of cultural norms there are pros and cons in different cultures in more western cultures very broadly speaking there can be much more of an emphasis on the individual as mm -hmm. well as on youth and then in more Eastern cultures, you may have an overemphasis on the group and on elders. What Islam does, Islam beautifully regulates the best of both. Mm -hmm. You find in, in, in one hadith, the prophet emphasizing both, that whoever is not respectful to our elders and is not merciful to our youngsters, and they're not from among us. The prophet is saying we need to do both. We need to have balance. So if someone, if they do one through five, and then maybe there's this ask, can you do number six? It needs to, the ask needs to be done in a way when the person is asking, can you do number six? It's okay for them to say no. And for, because what needs to happen is for there to be long, ideally long-term service. Mm -hmm. That does happen very often. I want to bring this up because mashallah, you have many years of experience in real time with the community. So if someone, there needs to be balance on both ends, right? If yeah. someone wants to volunteer, that's good. But within a specific capacity, that's often best. And then if someone is asking someone, hey, can you help out with something? It's okay for them to say no. It's a, because if they're spread too thin, it's not going to last. So I know I've mentioned a whole lot, but to, to bring it full circle, just in connection with the art of saying no or the practice of saying no. Do you have any thoughts on that, broadly speaking? Um, so it could I am be... a Go very ahead. poor example because that is something that I struggle with myself. But then I always go back to the sira of what Prophet Muhammad did and how he managed, it's people management, right? How, and they were all volunteers, subhanAllah, our sahaba are like the prime volunteer example who gave everything. But I, I, I really admire how Prophet Muhammad just mentored and elevated those that were doing something and encouraged those that were not. As in, for example, when they were collecting funds for Qazwai um, Tubuk and Osman Ghani comes in and he's like, I'm going to just give to the entire military campaign is mine. So everybody's like, OK, we can just all pack up and go home because nobody can like compete with him. But Prophet Muhammad does not stop there. And this is for even for us as nonprofit fundraisers and these things. I, I always look at that example of how he appreciates what Usman Ghani does, but then he also continues to motivate the others, not to match. And this is what I sometimes notice even here, right? We say, oh, that one is coming every day. Can you also come every day? Because you didn't even give them an opportunity to recognize <laughs> what they're doing. Evaluate. He, Prophet Muhammad said, "Put the three dates on the top of the pile." He gave the three day, the half a date, more than even the military campaign. The amount of ahadith we have about half a date is uh, you're you're like okay, everybody needs to bring half a date because that's something really awesome and really loved because he appreciated. So from the one who is asking for volunteering should be available to appreciate what the other is giving. Be receiving and be appreciative and recognize that there is effort that's being put in by them. And again, Surah Hujarat, don't imagine, don't assume. Oh, I know he could have given so much more. 
they could have just come here every week and they have this and this and this and um, they have all this time and they could just come in and do this. Maybe there are other things that you don't know about. But if you appreciate, you may get more hours from them or they may be so thankful that they will bring friends along who will end up giving more hours than them. How do we, uh, as the person who's asking, so two things, right? The person who's asking for the volunteer, appreciate the volunteer, recognize the work. Do not compare it with the other volunteers' work. Be realistic in your, uh, your asks of them and your appreciation of them. And number two, from the volunteer side, be very mindful of what you can do. Again, actions are based on intentions. This is an amana. When you are promising someone your time, it's an amana you've given them. Are you now going to be sadiq and amin in how you respond to what you said? I'm going to bring cookies for everyone who's going to be coming to the community star today. And then you say, oh, I forgot. Simple. I, I forgot. I was running late. I forgot. And the, and, and the masjid imam is probably smiling like you are right now, Brother Bilal. Like, Mashallah, Allah will give. It's okay, brother. I'm so glad you came. That's not what it is, right? This is my amana. If I said I am doing this, I have to be responsible because now it is my responsibility. I am the one who's going to be asked, did I complete my responsibility? So recognize, even if it is a volunteer position, you are promising someone for it and be there for it. Again, set your boundaries. If you cannot do it, don't promise it. Promise what you can do and then maybe over deliver and make them extra happy about you rather than over promise, <laughs> under deliver, which becomes a community norm. Does not mean if it is the youth or the elders, but it's a community norm to overpromise and under deliver. I think if we start setting realistic boundaries around what we are doing, what we're promising, how we're appreciating. And I think even as the, the organizers who are asking for volunteers, just I, I highly, highly emphasize, please don't call to judgment on what you assume that person's life is like and they should have given this much more or have been able to do this much or have been able to offer to drive the volunteers from here to there because they have a minivan. They may have so many other conditions that maybe they're shy and they don't want to tell you about it. So appreciate what they're doing, recognize so that they want to give more. Yeah, and you mentioned, Jazakal uh, a lot of uh, very beneficial points. Thank you for sharing all of them. Uh, you mentioned uh, not too long ago the importance of thankfulness. Mm -hmm. So if someone does, uh, figuratively, if they give for them what would be their half a day mm -hmm. for it and to show appreciation for it, because then they will likely, hopefully, give half a day again and again and then little by little, their situation improves. Oh, now I can afford giving 10 days. Mm -hmm. Let me give 10 dates because that seed was already planted. If I give half a date, I'm appreciated. If I give 10 dates, I'm still appreciated. And I, so you mentioned something very important. The type of culture the prophet created and cultivated was one of gratitude. Yes. And if we contrast it with... um. It's actually very interesting when you look at the 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 mentality of the hypocrites at the time of the Prophet wasalam, If someone came and gave a huge amount, here's the thing: because their hearts were unhealthy, mm -hmm. the lenses that they looked at other people with were unhealthy. Yes. So because because in their hearts was a disease. If someone came and gave a huge amount, they would criticize it and say, oh, they're just giving a huge amount to show off. Yes. And if someone came and gave a tiny amount, what would they say? Allah is not in need of this tiny amount. What difference is this tiny amount going to make? No matter what someone gave, they saw it in a negative way. 
that's a reflection of them internally. Yes. But then you find the Prophet والسلام, when someone gives a huge amount, I I I love the 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 name that you used to describe Sayyidina Uthman, uh, Uthman Ghani. Yes. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's such a precise description of him because uh, he was very, very rich both internally and externally yes. in his heart. عن, and then also he would bring that richness to life through actually tangibly giving uh, monetarily. Mm -hmm. He gives a huge amount. The Prophet appreciates it and is thankful. And then when, when someone, you know, if someone were to give even half a day, it's actually very interesting. Not not even a whole date, part of a date. Yeah. Part the prophets appreciating part of you're not even gonna donate a whole. The message is trying to raise a million dollars. Yes. You can't even give one dollar. You're giving fifty cents. What difference is that gonna make in the eyes of the prophet? That's noteworthy. That's mm -hmm. praiseworthy. And mm -hmm. then in in uh, in in another. Example, when the prophet mentioned the person who gave water to a dog, mm -hmm. monetarily, nowadays, that might be 50 cents, maybe a dollar. But Allah forgave them, gave them Jannah. Because, like you mentioned at the beginning, the intention. The intention. The power of the intention. The power of intention holds you accountable. It yeah. allows you to set your boundaries for what is happening. It allows you to set expectations. A lot of times our boundaries are also in expectation setting because yeah. I may give half a date and I expect to be called to the front of the masjid and we said, there she gave half a date. She is so amazing. Because if my intention was, I will be the half a date person who gets recognized, that intention is, 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 is messed up. But if uh, my intention was, I am going to give what I can today in this time, in this moment, this is all I can give, or this is what I want to give for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you with anything. Because then it is left to be multiplied with the infinite. Mm -hmm. But if I gave it in such a way with my own expectations, it is going to be multiplied with what those expectations are. Yeah. And then that number is usually a dividing number. When you divide, you get less. Yeah. Always. Yeah. But yeah. when you say, this is for Allah, and then Allah gives where he wants to give, how he wants to give, when he wants to give. But even what you said was so amazing, Brother Bilal, I just thought of, how Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even set boundaries for himself in asking and giving. Mm. If someone came to him and said, I need this, and he was not an actively wealthy man, right? He was not always just sitting on piles of gold and saying, okay, you take this, you take that. Whatever came to him, he just gave. But if he did not have that and he knew that he wanted to take care of this person's need, he would just go out and he would say, who will give to this person? It's not that he said, okay, fine, we're selling our house and we're moving out because this is, I don't have a boundary anymore. I have to give, I have to make sure this person is taken care of. He knew what his boundary was. And beyond that, then he would enlist other people to help him. Mm -hmm. So that same volunteer question that you brought up was so beautiful is that know your capacity. And if it's not there, bring other people along with you and or enlist other people so that that work can be done. JazakAllah khair. <laughs> How can we encourage people to, uh, to to give some time or even monetarily to support Rabata? I know you're, you're connected with, mashallah, different organizations. Uh, people may not realize how big of a difference mm -hmm. a all contribution makes especially when it's consistent yes whether it's a it's a if it's a donation and it's consistent if it's someone if someone says hey i cannot show up early to vacuum the masjid every week before juma i cannot donate ten thousand dollars every month i cannot do but i can be the cookie person for iftar every friday night that's my thing i'm gonna own that and i'm gonna be consistent then lo and behold, <laughs> Allah will put barakah in your consistency in ways that you could never predict it, but it'll only come through consistency. Allah opens unique doors 
only through the secrets and consistency. Maybe someone, they do that every Friday night in Ramadan or every mm -hmm. night for iftar, they make their intention. We're going to, and then after a week, lo and behold, when people see, oh, you're consistent. Hey, my daughter, my niece, my granddaughter loves baking. Can we help you? Yes. Hey, how many do you bring? Oh, I bring 300 cookies, for example, every iftar, every night. It's a whole ordeal. Okay, we're going to bring 100. So either we can add it to the 300 or we can take 100 off of your plate. How can, if you remain consistent in your own path, eventually other people will come along the way to assist you. But there has to be that uh, consistency first. And the prophet laid it out so beautifully, even if it's small, it can be small. It can be small. It can be the dhikr in the car. It can be when you're putting your baby to sleep. It can be when you're cooking, when you're cleaning, when you're doing the most mundane task. Connect mm -hmm. to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Develop your habit of talking to him, asking him, because it will set your internal and external boundary. At mm -hmm. the same time, commit to what you can do. Don't overcommit. Um, because... Take it from our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was known for Sadiq and Amin. Even at the time of Hijrah, he had he had the amana of the, the kuffar that were, and he had to leave uh, Ali radiallahu anhu behind to return the amana to them. Could have easily said, oh, they're after me. Let's just take this. This is what I'm taking right now. It's just going with me. But use, use our primary everyday teachings of Islam and Quran and the Sira and apply them in the way that it fits your life. Prophet Muhammad was always connected to Allah SWT. Be connected. He was setting boundaries and he was recognizing and he was not breaching. He was not taking away from his family and giving to the community. He was not taking away from the community, giving to his family. He was not taking away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the only one that he probably took away was his own sleep. He took away his time, but he gave it to wherever it was needed. Apply, apply your boundaries. Use the Quran and Sira to recognize what the boundaries look like. Because the the I think the one caution I would say is if we start looking at the world outside and setting boundaries, they can sometimes set us uh, away from what the right path is. So recognize what your boundary needs to look like from the Quran and Sira. Apply it to today. Stay on it. Actions are based on intention and just walk the path. One step at a time. Mm -hmm. little by little. Yes. I thank you again for your time, especially given all the different hats that you wear, or maybe I should say hijabs that you wear. Yes. <laughs> From family to this, to community and school and alhamdulillah. May Allah put a uh, blessing in your time and your efforts. May Allah bless your family because uh, this can't happen without some kind of support behind the scenes and for there to be, um, you know, on, on each of our ends. So alhamdulillah, we thank Allah for the support systems that he's, that he's granted us. And we ask Allah to, uh, to bless them. And we ask Allah to make it easy for us to take anything of benefit from what was shared today, from what you shared today, and to put it in practice little by little as best we can. We hope and we pray that these uh, words are proof for us on Judgment Day, not against us. We can go ahead and wrap up, inshallah. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rahim wa al-asr. Inna al-insana fi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amru amru salihat. Wa tawasu bil-haqi wa tawasu bil-sabih. Jazakum khair. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.